Well, good morning, everyone. At this time, I'd like to invite up George Gamble, who has a special message for us today. Thanks, George. Thanks, Mary Beth. Let's, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I uh, stand here in your presence, uh, Lord, in, in the sight of all these people of a miserable, wretched sinner, Lord, saved by your grace, redeemed by your mercy, Lord, and I just ask, as John the Baptist said, uh, that I may decrease and you may increase, Lord, and, and that uh, this message is from you and through me, and I just ask that you open the hearts and minds of, of everyone here to, to what I uh, have to present this morning, Lord. And all this I pray in Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. All right, good morning. not easy being 12. Um, so this is my testimony uh, this morning. So uh, buckle up. Um, <laughs> so I've attended church here for, I don't know, 16, 17 years. I typically go to the 11 o'clock service uh, for those uh, that don't know me. That's why. Um, so, uh, this, so this is my testimony. And uh, Madison, our, our oldest daughter, is, uh, is doing the PowerPoint. So just wanted to acknowledge her. All right, next slide, Mary. This was probably my lowest point. <laughs> we'll start off with that. I was five. Uh, don't pity me because I probably deserved it. Uh, my mother would do this periodically uh, as a form of punishment. It took two or three times before I realized that if I rocked it and fell over, then I could I could push my way out, but uh, <coughs> but this will come up a little bit later um, uh, in the presentation, and and I have to do things by PowerPoint. That's just just how I do things. So so everything's on PowerPoint here. Go ahead, Mary. Okay, so on our property in Kalora, <coughs> we um, there were piles of of rocks uh, all across the property when we bought it before we built the house. And uh, so what I did after we moved in and everything, I had to, you know, figure out what to do with those rocks. And so I decided to, to build a wall and, and close an acre of our property. And so I'm not a physically imposing guy, so it, it was hard work for me. So it, it turned out that it was my prayer wall. I had to pray the entire time I was building this wall. Um, and so this is the result of that. You can see it's not, you know, it's not a an architectural wonder or anything, but it's something that I worked on over several years, uh, nights and weekends, to, uh, to, to build. Uh, and it was during this time, on the 5th of June, 1999, that I was born again, during one of those prayer sessions, slaving away on this wall. And, and what I said to the Lord at that time, I said, Lord, I cannot live the life that you're calling me to live. It's impossible. I can't do it. And I need you uh, to get me through that. <clears throat> and so, the thrust of this testimony is to tell you what got me to that point. Okay, everything the Lord did to draw me to Him. Okay, next slide, Mary. Okay, so there there are s seven instances that I'm going to talk about here on this slide of folks who stepped uh, up into my life uh, and did something that drew me closer to God. You can see the scripture there is no one can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him. Okay, so th these are the instances, and there are many more, but these are the seven that I chose. Instances where God drew me to him. The first is Marie Logan. She was a vacation Bible school teacher at Ebenezer Methodist Church. And I guess I was in middle school about this time. And she... You know, middle, if you've ever taught middle school kids, you know how just out of control they can be. And so it was during that week that I felt God's presence uh, through her in the way that she in gentleness uh, and kindness led that class. And we were, you know, as well behaved as, as you could be. And at the end of the week, she said how amazing it was that we were that well behaved. And so it... it it made an impression on me that, yeah, you know, when you're, when you're introduced to God's word and God is working through someone, that it can be a calming effect and it can, 
can help you to, to listen to, to the lesson. So that was, that was a wonderful experience. And it's a very early uh, recollection of God's work. Uh, the next one is Johnny Cole was a uh, gentleman that I graduated with, and, and he's had a r- very rough time. But he called me one day when we were probably eighth or ninth grade and asked me to come over and play basketball. <coughs> basketball is my favorite sport, so I was like, sure, I'll be over. Well, when I got there, there was another kid there that was a little older. And this kid had brought Johnny to uh, pray the sinner's prayer and to come uh, to, to Christ uh, the day before. And so Johnny said, hey, I got a guy that, that you could talk to. So <coughs> called me up. I went over and played basketball. And this guy witnessed to me for, I don't know, two or three hours in the, in the cold rain that day. And I didn't buckle. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't succumb to his witnessing powers because, I mean, I, it felt as though he was doing it for, for selfish reasons. He wanted to put another, another notch on his Bible. Um, but it did have an impact on me that, from Johnny's perspective, that he was willing to step out uh, and lead me, uh, try to lead me to Christ. And so that, that, that had a profound impact uh, on me looking back. Now, I know each of you, you know, looking back over your lives, can see these same sort of instances where God was drawing you, okay? And, th- and, and so this is one of those times that, at the time, it was an annoyance. But looking back, I could see that this is a time when God was trying to draw me. The next one, Andy. I went to Salisbury University uh, in the late 80s and and (coughs) worked for the athletic department checking IDs uh, for students when they used the the basketball courts or the tennis courts. And this one evening I was working at the tennis courts and this husband and wife were handing out gospel tracts on campus. <clears throat> and I thought that I could, you know, debate uh, the husband on why Christianity was wrong and why, you know, the Bible was not inspired and why, how there were contradictions in the Bible. Of course, I had no evidence. I had no scripture I could point to, to you know, to support my, my assertion. So I looked like a fool looking back on it. But he just stood there and listened to me patiently. And at the end, just kind of shrugged his shoulders and handed me the track. Um, and I never read it. I threw it away. Um, but looking back, it's another instance where God was, was planting a seed and trying to bring me to repentance. <coughs> Go ahead, Mandy. This is the, the day my father passed away. He was 40, 44 years old. I'm 45. <coughs> Did the Lord take my father uh, in order to bring me to repentance? No. I don't, I don't believe that. But it did demonstrate to me quite clearly how fragile life is. I mean, he was in the prime of his life, and, um, and he was taken very, very quickly and very easily. And so uh, it, it had a profound impact on me to see that, look, we can, we can die at any moment. <coughs> I mean, I ask any of you, to, after the service, write down the date that you will die. Um, you, you, no one can do it. You just don't know. It could happen at any moment. And it often does. This is our wife. We met 11 months later, and um, she had gone to church her whole life. And so, and I had gone to church, you know, occasionally, vacation Bible school holidays, but she, she had gone to, ch- to church her, her entire life, and so I started going to church with her, <coughs> and she went to St. Paul's Lutheran Church in Highland Town, which is right across the street from where Miss Dolores taught elementary school for uh, many years, and it's right down the street from Hausner's Restaurant, but, and that's where we were married as well. But I started going to church, and her pastor, go ahead, Mandy, Pastor Kusherbar was a, was a gentle giant. He was a large man, Harvard-educated, very good at delivering a sermon, just a very gentle, humble shepherd of his, of his flock. And he had a very bad speech impediment. And so when he spoke, he had to choose his words very carefully. 
And you'll see why that's important in a few more slides. Go ahead, Mary. Paul in Haiti was here uh, for several years as our youth director, and he <coughs> forced Doug Wiggins and I to stand up before the youth would drop in at the middle school and to lead a devotional. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. Okay, I, I didn't know how to do that. I didn't know what it meant. I didn't know uh, what to say. But I did the best I could, and he was very encouraging, even when <coughs> I struggled at times. And so that, that was the lesson of, of what it meant to step out in faith and to know that the Lord was there uh, to get you through that, and especially when you're delivering a message, his message, that he will give you the words uh, necessary to, to, see, to see that through. So back to Pastor Kusherbar. It was, you know, when you get married, you meet with the pastor. And it was during those, those counseling sessions leading up to our wedding that he asked me this question. Why are you going to heaven? And I said, again, very foolishly, well, because I'm a good person. And he hung his head and shook his head. And he looked me straight in the eye. And said, no, because Jesus died for you. Well, if he reached below his desk and pulled out a two-by-four and smacked me upside the head, it would not have had as much impact as that question and that answer had on me. Because I didn't understand what that meant. I had no clue what that meant. I, I didn't know why he had to die. And I didn't know what that had to do with me. It didn't make sense to me. And so from that moment on, I had to find out. I had to figure it out, okay, because, you know, I just graduated college. I was working on my master's degree. You know, I thought I was reasonably intelligent, but I didn't have a clue, okay? <clears throat> there was a whole spiritual life that I knew nothing about. And the reason I have this picture up here, because I thought, eh, it's all on my own merit, because I'm a good person. It's all the good things I've done. That would, uh, that would be enough <clears throat> for me to enter heaven uh, when I die. Go ahead, Mary. All right, that's good. Stop there. So after that, eventually we were married. Then we started attending here, you know, through Jim's sermons. Uh, I was starting to pick up a little bit, and I said to Janice, look, we need to start going to Sunday school. Um, so we started attending Tom Connolly's class, and we were going through the Old Testament uh, at, at first, and I was learning, I was learning, but one day in class, <coughs> I kind of said rhetorically, just above a whisper, well, what is sin exactly? And the looks I got from the people in that class was like, y you don't know what sin is? Are you crazy? Why, are you, you know, what are you, what's going on here? So I, uh, so I had to find out. I had to figure that out because I realized that they knew something I didn't. And rather than risk embarrassment, I, I needed to find out what that meant. So I started researching through the Bible, of course. And it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear what sin is. Sin is well-defined. Okay? Sin is transgression of the law. Go to the next one, Mary. That's in 1 John. And then Paul tells us, by the law is the knowledge of sin. Go to the next one. I would not have known sin except through the law. Okay? So it's quiz time, folks. What, what is he talking about here? What is the Lord trying to tell us? What is the law? Hold that. Thank you. Yes, it's the Ten Commandments. In, in general. So what are they? What's the Ten Commandments? Just yell them out. Thou shalt not. Okay, murder. Make sure it's... Do not bear false witness. That's number seven. Or that's not number seven. That's uh, number nine. What's that? No. All right, there you go. There's three. There you go. There's number four. Not number four, but that's the 
Okay. All right, that's the first one. That's the essence of the first one, yeah. Okay. We've got six now. All right, that's ten. That's number ten. Three more. What's that? Do not commit adultery. Number seven. All right, two more. There you go. All right. That's good enough. Go ahead, Maddie. All right, so here they are. Thank you, guys. I didn't. I should have told you at the beginning I was going to do the quiz. All right, one God, no idolatry. Do not take the Lord's name in vain. This is my paraphrase. Keep the Sabbath holy. I think that's the one we missed. Honor your parents. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not lie. Do not covet. Now, these appear on their surface to be pretty straightforward. Okay, but there's a spiritual element to this. And I'll give you a couple examples. Number six, do not murder. Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, if you hate your brother, it's as though you've committed murder in your heart. Okay, so if you've ever called somebody an idiot without cause, okay, you're in danger of, of committing murder. Number seven, do not commit adultery. If you even look at someone with lust, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Okay, we've all done it. All right, next slide. So I started looking further in Scripture. And so now I'm going to give you a, a whole string of Scripture here. <coughs> And I'm going to take you through sin, judgment, and righteousness, okay? The law, our schoolmaster, is our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. Okay, so the Ten Commandments serve a purpose for Christians. But for us, they're like a mirror. You can look into the Ten Commandments and see how God sees you. He loves you, no doubt about it. But he does not like the sin and the Ten Commandments are, are a tool for us to recognize the sin in our lives. Okay? And, it, and it's important to do that so we might be justified by faith, as it says there. Okay, next one, Maddie. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Okay? It's for everybody doesn't matter. And it's funny, when you present this to people, they have no defense because their conscience tells them that they've broken God's command. Okay? He's put those commandments on their hearts. Next one, Maddie. The other thing I want to talk about <coughs> with sin that I needed to understand is that I used to believe that sin was horizontal. Okay? It was basically when you sinned, you hurt someone else. Okay? And so you didn't want to sin because you, you didn't want to hurt the people around you or the people that you were dealing with. And that's true. There is an element of that in sin. Okay? But sin is also vertical. Okay? And more importantly, it's vertical. Because when you sin, you sin against God, the creator, the, per the person that gi has given you everything that you have, your breath, your family, you know, everything. Okay, and David brought this out pretty clearly <coughs> when he was confronted by Nathan uh, when he sinned with Bathsheba, which, as Steve Bash rightfully pointed out, that he broke every one of the Ten Commandments with that one episode. Against you and you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Okay, next, Maddie. One more. How then can I do this wickedness and sin against God, Joseph said, uh, when he was tempted by Potiphar's wife, okay? He was sinning against God, and that's why he did not do that, because he understood what that truly meant. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight, the prodigal son said when he, <coughs> when he met up with his father uh, on his way home. Okay, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. This is from Jeremiah. It, it cracks me up. Well, it doesn't crack me up. I understand, but uh, people always say, well, he really has a good heart. And he's really, underneath it all, a very nice person. Well, the Bible has, says something different. And I understand that they're saying that they like that person and they're, 
and they were being, you know, nice. And <clears throat> but that's not what that's not what God says about us. And I'm gonna that's gonna be all right. Jesus said, "No one is good but one that is God." Okay. He said that to the young rich ruler in Luke 18. When when uh, the young rich ruler called him good, he said, wait a minute, only God is good. <clears throat> and he's talking about moral perfection here, moral goodness. That's not right. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, we're all the same, as I said before. Next one, Matt. And if you think that, ah, you know, I'm not as bad as that Hitler guy or that Jeffrey Dahmer or whoever else you can name that's that's hailed as, as the epitome of evil. Okay, that's that's pride. You need to be careful. Everyone proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Next one. Okay, there will be judgment. I'll get to that a little bit more, but Rest assured that God will judge the secrets of men. You can see Psalm 139. Okay, he knows every thought, word, and deed, past, present, and future. Next one, Matt. For it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment. Okay, there's a, there's a saying. Uh, it's not in the Bible, but it, I think it's pretty appropriate. <clears throat> it says, die once, or born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. What that means is you're physically born, and then you're physically dead. But if you're not spiritually born, okay, you'll have a spiritual death. So it's born once, die twice. Born twice, die once. And so this is talking about it is appointed for, rent for men to die once. That's that first physical death. And after that, we will have to face judgment. Here's what uh, the Lord says through the, the writer of Hebrews. For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. Next one, Matt. And in Revelation, but the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Now he's talking about the second death. Okay, that spiritual death. How many lies have you told? I know I've told a bunch. This is what I had to come to terms with. Okay, this is what the Lord was showing me to bring me to repentance. Next one, Matt. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life but the wrath of God abides on him. It's popular to say that Jesus saves us from our sins. And that's true. But he really saves us from God's wrath, okay? Because God must, must punish sin. He's eternal, okay? He's the creator. What he says becomes true, okay? All wisdom comes from God. And so he must punish sin sin. He, he, he can do nothing else. Okay? And so we have a choice to make. God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Okay? <clears throat> this is where the love part comes in. And he loves us beyond, beyond anything we can ever imagine. Okay? And he showed it by taking on flesh and coming to earth and dying for us to pay the penalty for that sin. I can't emphasize it enough. Okay, it is a gift. We don't de even deserve it, but he did it anyway. Okay, for the wages of death, the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. and he's patient. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, 
but that, that all should come to repentance. He's waiting. He wants you <clears throat> to turn to Him. He's calling you home. Okay, that's what He was doing with me. All those episodes that some, some you would say failed, okay, if you were looking at them objectively, okay, but He's always calling us home. And that's what amazes me and what just drives me to my knees and just slays me every time. It's just the utter perfection of his plan. Okay? No matter what happens, if you make that choice, okay, all the glory goes to him because you didn't deserve it. Okay? He did everything necessary to bring you home, to bring you to him. Okay? You, you, you're not, none of us deserve it. If you reject it, then he kept his word, and all the glory goes to him. Still, even in that, even in that case, okay. And we will look in heaven at what took place and say, wasn't he a kind God to give us every opportunity to come home, to come to him? And those that did not. They will be without excuse. Okay? Every mouth will be stopped. This word grace is really important. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Grace is unmerited favor. It's getting a gift you don't deserve. Okay? And that's what he's done for us. It's Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. That's, so how, do, how, do we, how, how does that happen? How does this happen? And this is what, uh, these are the two words that are so important. Repentance and faith. Okay? To repent means to turn. To turn from your sin. You've got to recognize it as as sin against God, as you're transgressing his law, okay? He knows past, present, future, uh, thought, word, and deed what you've done, okay? You've got to turn from that. You've got to recognize it as wrong, and you've got to turn from it, and then you've got to confess to him and put your trust in him. Faith, you know, I know there's a chapter, or Hebrews 11, 1, finds faith, excuse me, but it, but it is a simpler way to understand faith. It's to trust and to obey. Okay, so once you turn, then you have to obey. Okay, and put your trust in him. It's not easy. Okay, but over time, he builds that faith in you. As you step out in faith, you learn that, yeah, hey, I can have faith. Okay, I can trust and obey. And he, and he, and he gets me there. Repentance and faith. These are a couple of verses where Jesus calls out for repentance. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Okay. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, okay, you confess him as Lord. You know, it took me a while. It was easy to confess him as my Savior after June 99, <clears throat> but to then make him my Lord, you know, that's, your faith has to build a little bit over time before that, that's easily proclaimed, okay? And so that's, this verse, they, you know, they, they focus on confess and believe, uh, but that, but Lord Jesus is an important element in that verse, <coughs> confessing that he is Lord. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Okay, he's faithful to you that if you do that, the repentance and faith, that you will be saved. Go ahead, Mary. Well, this is the verse that, that uh, brought me to, to repentance and, and faith. No condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who did not who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. 
I couldn't walk the walk under my own power. I, I knew I couldn't. Okay? It was only in Christ, if, only if I was in Christ could I walk according to the Spirit. And, um, so that's why I said, Lord, I cannot live the life you're calling me to live. I can't do it without you. And, and, I, and I remember distinctly, well, everyone's conversion story is very subjective. So <clears throat> I can describe it to you, but, but it, it wouldn't mean anything to you. So I'll, I'll just leave it. But, but I was a new person from that point on. Okay, let's go ahead. Okay, so I would just ask you, and I'm going to challenge you a little bit here, these next couple of slides. Are we sowing the seeds of truth and grace? Okay, like Marie Logan, are we teaching, you know, Sunday school and VBS? Like Johnny Cole, are we bringing people to know Christ? Okay, like Janice, well, I wouldn't ask you to marry anyone, simply to, to help bring them to Christ. But, <coughs> but Janice said, I'm a Christian, I go to church every Sunday. Okay, she stood her ground. And the heathen I was, I said, okay. I went with her. So she was very steadfast in that. And I thank her every day. Tracts on campus. Are you sowing seeds? Are you? I hand out tracts like crazy. Not that I'm the example, but <clears throat> it's something that uh, is very important because even if they don't read it, they know what it is and they see your, your action. Okay? Later on, it could have an impact. Pastor Kusherbar asked the question, why are you going to heaven? Okay, he had to, that, that question is so well phrased. And I know he put thought into it, and it's probably the question that he used often. And Pastor Vaughn, are you encouraging people to step out in faith? Okay, no one can come to me except the Father which has sent me draws him. He uses us. We are the church. Okay, we are in Christ. He uses us to draw people to him. Okay, he has the spirit. The spirit is working on them as well. That's why all those, all those things that happened to me, which look like fail, failures, the spirit used those to draw me closer. All right, man. So here's a challenge to believers. Actually, I did print this out, but I don't think I got it. <coughs> the first three... Many of you probably recognize those. those. That's where the Great Commission is, is listed in the Bible. It's listed three times. Anytime something's repeated in the Bible, it's important. So that's the Great Commission. The next two are when you step out in faith to witness, the next two is what you can, what you can, uh, what you can expect <coughs> in your reward. So I, I will let that, I'll let you read those. Okay, so in 1 John, he tells us, these things I have written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. Okay, You can know that you are saved. You can know that you are in Christ. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourself. Okay? Next one. Okay, so if you're unsure about that, let me ask a few questions. Do you grieve over the sin in your life? Does it bother you? Are you wrestling with it? Should I do that? Should I not do that? Why am I doing that? That, that seems wrong. Okay, if, that, if that's the battle waging in, inside of you, then the Holy Spirit is working on you, bringing you to repentance. Do you thirst for God's truth? Guys, I cannot go through a day without reading the Bible. i got to have it. Okay, and I hope you have the same feeling. <clears throat> is Jesus preeminent in your life? Is he precious to you? Do you recognize what he did, okay, to bring you to faith? Okay, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
Okay, we are a new creation in Christ. Our hearts and our desires are very different. Sometimes they, they build momentum over time, but, it, but you should be a different person. All right, next one. Today is the day of salvation, or now is the day of salvation, as one translation says. Okay? If you know you're not saved, okay, think about what we talked about this morning. Go home. Honestly, I think altar calls are kind of silly, but and, I, and I'm not qualified to do that sort of thing, so I'm not even going to attempt it. But go home today, okay? Get on your knees and pray to the Lord and ask for forgiveness and ask Him to come into your heart. It's very simple, okay? But it'll make a huge difference in your life today. And certainly, you know, think about where will you be in 100 years? Oh, I'll be dead. Yes, but where will you be? Okay, 10 out of 10 people die. People like laughing at you, but it's true. Okay. Thank you. And now we are going to sing hymn 707. Is that true? No. That's 11 o'clock. I'm an 11 o'clock guy. Okay. So while they're going upstairs, let's, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just thank you for these folks, for their attention, to my ramblings about you, Lord. And uh, <clears throat> I just thank you and praise you for all you've done for me and for those in this room, Lord. I just ask that you continue to bring us all to repentance and faith, Lord, because we know that even if we're saved, Lord, you're always calling us home. You're always calling us closer to you and drawing us, Lord. And we just thank you and praise <coughs> your holy name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for that message today, George.